Hi, this is Steve Roost, and you're listening to Health Tech Hour on UK Health Radio. Each week, we give you the best news, views, and interviews from the health technology world. From CEOs and founders to entrepreneurs and clinicians, the companies and people that are shaping the future face of healthcare. All on the world's number one talk health radio. Hello and welcome to this week's Health Tech Hour on UK Health Radio. My name is Steve Roost and each week we bring you the best news, views and interviews with the CEOs, leaders, founders and clinicians who are changing the face of healthcare in the UK and beyond. As everybody knows that's listened regularly, um, I'm a health tech founder myself of a company called PocDoc. We are enabling or supercharging digital pathways for cardiovascular disease by allowing anyone with a smartphone to test themselves for a full five market cholesterol panel. Um, we are being used widely across the UK in pharmacies and in the NHS. Uh, PocDoc helped put the show on. So thank you very much to those guys. Uh, I guess me. Um, so the um, <laughs> as ever, I want to say thank you to everyone who's listening live on UK Health Radio. Thanks to the team, Johan, as ever, producer extraordinaire. Um, the Also, thank you to anyone that's listening uh, on the podcast channels, whether that's Spotify or Amazon or Google, we are on all of them. And our numbers have been great going up and up and up, which is awesome. We're picking up listeners in all kinds of new countries. So shout out to people in Saudi, Kuwait, Bahrain, Chile, Colombia, Vietnam, Thailand, Canada, US. We're, we're truly global at this point. So 40 countries and counting every month. And um, also just to let you know that if you do want to catch up on any UK Health Radio show, uh, UK Health Radio has its own channel on Spotify and all of the shows are available. So the, the station actually covers a huge range of everything to do with health and different aspects of people's health. So go check it out. Um, and otherwise, thanks for listening. Thanks for tuning in. We exist to help you guys. Um, and, you know, I know I love talking about these things, but it's great that, that it seems like people like listening to it as well. So. On to today's show. We're actually in a new area on today's show. I realized I scrolled back through the 81 or so shows that we've done. And I don't believe that we've ever had anyone on the show who um, from a from a business, a biotech company that was developing therapies within cancer. I think we've had some other things around the space, but we've never actually had a pure drug discovery, drug developer therapy developer on the show. So today we have Will West, who's the CEO of Cell Centric, and I will let him explain his aspects of science without butchering them too much. But they are focused in on developing drugs or, or, or drugs within the epigenetic space targeting cancer led by the Inabrodib. I'm sure he'll say that a little bit better, but the Inabrodib compound, um, which is a P300 CBP inhibitor. Um, Will has a PhD in virology and is an advisor to many biotech startups, including some of the people that have been on the show, actually. So cited Marcel Guerin came on a few weeks ago. He's a good friend of ours, actually. So we're both based in Cambridge. Um, so, yeah, Will, welcome to the show. How are you? Thanks very much, Steve. Great to be on and uh, good luck with Pop Doc as well. Sounds really exciting. Thank you very much. So, Will, what? Let's start with your kind of journey and then we can get into what Cell Centric's doing. Because obviously you've been in and around this. You, you are you have a technical background, clearly scientist. What was your development? You were clearly in academia because you did a PhD and then you moved across into, I guess, the private space in some way, shape or form. So that's an oh, I, I always love that journey, you know, of someone that was in academia or in a technical role or a clinical role and they move across. So what what motivated that for you? Uh, yeah, no, really good question. Um, so I, I was doing my uh, PhD. I was actually sponsored by uh, Unipath, uh, which was really helpful. So okay. I got some experience when I was doing that. Um, and I did have the opportunity to join uh, industry at that point. Uh, but I'd met a guy at a conference, uh, how these things go, who really inspired me and to go and work for him in his institute and so that was a guy called Jim Stott um, and so I did a, a postdoc uh, funded by um, 
the Medical Research Council, affiliated with the World Health Organization, but working on um, vaccines for um, HIV. So okay. that was kind of when I was, yes, a proper. And when academic. was that? When was that? What time? What, when, when was that in like actual like years, so to speak? When was uh, that? God. Uh, sorry, Roughly. I didn't check that. Give or uh, take <laughs> to the nearest five years. <laughs> yeah, it was sort of uh, early mid 90s. Okay, so that was pretty early on. Yeah, that yeah. must be very early on. In yeah, the, there were no therapies for but, HIV at that point. No, none. No. Wow. And when um, I, I, I didn't. I, that, this is why I love doing the show. Is these little kind of insights. So, can you explain what it was like being invited or being asked to work on that particular area at that time? It must have been, on the one hand, uh, I don't know, but quite scary because it was a new scary disease with no therapies, but also knowing enough scientists dare I say, slightly exciting and very interesting at the same time, possibly. I, I think it was exactly both of those. Um, I mean, more recently, I was involved with uh, Robin Shattuck and uh, the COVID programme. Um, and actually, it was kind of similar because in the early days, you just didn't know where it was going to go or how big it was going to impact the world and, and the shape it was going to take. Mm. I suppose the contrast has been... You know, vaccines for HIV have have, have not really landed, and it, it's very no. interesting how sort of virology and immunology works. That you know, we had success with COVID, but it took a long time to make any progress at all with HIV, which obviously was was very frustrating given the resources that were being thrown at it. So it was kind of really exciting, and in the immunology side of it, it's kind of nobody knew how immunology really worked. I mean, we had right. T help of one cells, T help of two cells, but they were very ill-defined. Whereas now, you know, 20 years later, the understanding of how immunology works is there's still a lot to explore, but actually we know so much more than we did then. I mean, we a lot of aspects of both sort of T cell based immunity and then B cell antibodies was was really only beginning to be understood. And how much of that delta in understanding was driven by lack of technology versus time as in you've had 20 more years of research by x thousands of researchers all over the world and it's just sort of churned out more knowledge versus actually you needed to wait for certain pieces of technology that have suddenly allowed the field to develop significantly definitely the technical um, aspects have improved massively you know sequencing technologies being able to clone things really quickly um you know the tools we have in the lab are, are amazing right they can also be distracting because if 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 one thing can shine a light on this bit over here it doesn't necessarily shine a light over here so you can actually sometimes be misled because you're using the latest technology that does this bit over here so actually i think it's strong uh government funding that made a big difference over the last 20 years mm -hmm. um, in the UK, but also internationally. Um, and yeah, a lot of hard graft and yeah, people building on each other's knowledge. And with your comment around HIV, and we'll come, we'll, we'll get to cancer in a second, but I think it's yeah. still a really interesting, I mean, it's been such a um, uh, constant, if you like, for, for people of a certain generation, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the drive for an HIV vaccine, new therapies and so on. It's been, a, it, as you say, it's had a huge amount of funding, a huge amount of cultural awareness um, globally for it. And, and you sort of contrasted it there slightly with the, the COVID vaccine. But they're a little different in the sense that the COVID vaccine never actually stopped anyone really getting COVID. Or have I misunderstood? It was sort of, that was the aim, I think, originally. And then it sort of transpired that it wouldn't... Took, uh, Whereas with HIV, I would imagine that the goal there is you either want to stop someone giving it to somebody or someone doesn't get it, which is actually, I would imagine, significantly harder than where the COVID sort of vaccine landed. Is that is that in any way accurate, what I just said there? Yeah, so you need to break it down into, are you trying to stop people getting infected? Are you trying to stop people infecting others? Or are you trying to keep people alive? And mm different technologies address those three things in slightly different ways. Um, I suppose the advantage, well, or the advancement in HIV was definitely the um, 
antiretroviral drugs that, that really came through and the fact that we can now use a cocktail of them to really um, keep people healthy, let alone alive, yeah. which, which, is, which is a fantastic improvement. Uh, but it just goes to show that producing vaccines is not trivial. And, no. No. <laughs> and we don't fully really no. understand why some work better than others, frankly. Yeah, and so I had a bit, one final question on HIV. But how would you classify So I think what was interesting around COVID there was a lot that was interesting, but this, I, and I think you just alluded to it there, is this this definition of what is a vaccine. So you're either sort of something that stops someone getting it, someone that stops it giving it to somebody, or something that prevents or, or um, reduces the risk of serious illness or death. And I think prior to COVID, I think if you'd have asked 100 people, they probably would have thought it's, I'm not going to get it, or I won't be able to give it to, to anybody. And I'm not sure necessarily that people realize that potentially the definition of vaccine actually had that third strand to it. So um, how, where would you classify PrEP, the, the, um, the, the HIV treatment that I, believe, I, I think you can take it and then it prevents you from, it reduces your viral load to such a low level that you then can't, can, you can't transmit it to others. Um, is, is that a vaccine or is that some, a therapy or what is that? How would you classify that? Well, a vaccine is something that's trying to elicit an immune response that then delivers something. So that is slightly different what you're describing. But ultimately, this is all about healthcare benefit and delivering that healthcare benefit. So, mm-hmm. yes, we can get caught up in semantics of stuff, but we're trying to keep people healthy. We're trying to. Yeah. I mean, that's ultimately the goal that we're doing in all the different aspects of what we do. Okay. Okay. Good. All right. Cool. So, how when when did the transition across the like full industry start and your pathway into um, cancer treatments, drug discovery, biotech? How did that happen? Yeah. So I think there are two steps really. Um, so, working in an institute, I was thinking, well, where am I going to be in ten years' time? You know, do I want to become the director of an institute? Is that me? Am I capable of doing that? And mm-hmm. and I suppose, yeah, two things. One is I didn't think that actually that was kind of for me, uh, let alone whether I was able to do it or not. It's something else. But but actually, I was more interested in doing the doing and doing the sort of how do you take science and make it into products and devices and diagnostics and things like that. And and I think that's what really drove me. So. Um, I did leave after two and a half years. Um, I joined a big a pharmaceutical company. I stayed there for seven years, worked globally on multiple uh, respiratory GI programs uh, from mainly North America, but but over in uh, Asia, China, South America. Um, I loved it. It was great running big programs, lots of amazing people. I was never home. <laughs> I was just <laughs> always right. trapped. And, uh, and actually my main motivation for thinking well actually can I do something that's more in my own control can I start a company myself it was more about you know living life on my own terms I I I love the way that that you 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 your life was so hectic that starting your own company was was a less hectic option yeah, <laughs> I mean, that's you've got to be pretty hectic if you're like, I'm going to chill out for a bit and just start my own company. <laughs> um, so so why why cancer? Why focusing there? Um, so I did join a, a biotech for a short period of time before helping form Cell Centric. Um, mm-hmm. That's with a, a Cambridge academic called Azim Sarani. Um, he was one of the first people to describe that there's a code beyond DNA that says what genes should be used or not used um, and really controls cell fate, you know, whether a cell becomes a stem cell or a skin cell or a hair cell. There's this code that sits on top of the DNA sequence and it's heritable to some extent as well. So it can be passed from one generation to the other. So, you know, this idea that you, your environment can influence you, but also then your offspring is mm. because of this phenomenon called epigenetics. Yeah. So we were looking at that and thinking, well, this is amazing science. It's going to lead to somewhere. We had literally no idea what it might be used for, although we did know that we could turn one type of cell into another by stripping off the epigenetic imprint. Um, and, and that was potentially something we could uh, think about commercialising. 
actually a, a guy called Shinya Yamanaka came up with a much better way of doing that and won the Nobel Prize within three years. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a shame, isn't it? <laughs> so, that's yeah. So, it. That's a kicker. But, but by that stage, it's kind of like, well, we're understanding all these processes that kind of say, how does the cell say healthy? Why does it become disease? What's triggering that? Mm-hmm. And of course, a lot of when cells are going out of control, that is cancer. So we were finding a lot of proteins that were associated with DNA and, and chromatin, which is sort of uh, you know, how um, a DNA is 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 sort of constructed. It's we were finding proteins that when they were doing the wrong thing, they could potentially cause cancer. And so we took the sort of the foundation in epigenetics and said, well, how can we apply that to oncology, potential new cancer drugs, by targeting these unexplored proteins that we now know what they do. Okay. We're going to unpack quite a lot in there. Okay, just for our, because we have a broad church of listeners, you know, and um, as ever, we, 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 on the show, we're very much open to getting into the technical piece of it, but we always want to make sure that everyone is sort of brought with us and understands some of this stuff. So I personally find epigenetics fascinating and um, hugely exciting. So let's just start with that bit of it. So go back a step and you basically said epigenetics is almost a code that sits on top of your DNA that tells your cells how to behave. Is that correct? Yes. It's a combination of tags to the DNA itself and modifications to the proteins that sit on top of DNA or DNA wraps itself around. And before, when was this discovered or started to be discovered roughly? About 30 years ago, just over 30 years ago. Okay. So what did, what, what, how was it like discovered? What, what was happening? What were those initial things that they were like, oh, that's a bit strange. Is it this? Is it that? How did it sort of come to light? It was mainly by looking at um, stem cells and seeing how they differentiate and what was involved with that early differentiation process as embryos form. Right. So let's get into stem cells now. This is great. So, again, huge amount of, I would say, well, Huge amount, I would say, of sort of probably latent awareness in stem cell treatments and the phrase stem cells and this type of thing. Why are they sort of so special, particularly as regards epigenetics, I guess? It's because they're so fluid and and that they don't have sort of a locked down fingerprint or, you know, what they're supposed to be doing. And that kind of comes over time in the early days of, uh, of the embryo developing. So it was really by looking at those processes and going, well, hang on a minute, why, why, why are these tags suddenly appearing? Or why, mm. why are these proteins over here suddenly being modified? It, it, it was understanding that that led to this um, code beyond DNA being discovered. And everyone has it, right? This is the, the, everyone has an epigenetic code layer. This is, yeah, yeah. It, it's, it, it's, 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 a, it's like DNA. Yes. Yes. yes in effect. And, I know I sound really stupid, but I'm going to just ask all the questions anyway, because that's what I do. Um, so presumably, does every living creature have a genet- epigenetic layer in some way, shape or form? It, it's part of DNA, it's part of life, or, or is it exclusive to certain people, certain types? So there's a fantastic book called Epigenetics by Nessa Kerry, which I definitely recommend to you. I will email it over to you. That would be uh, great. Explains a lot of this, but... Um, the higher the organism, the more complicated the epigenetic imprint is. So yeah, humans have many, many different types of epigenetic modification, both to the DNA itself, but also to histones, which are the main proteins that DNA wraps itself around. So there's around more than 60 different modifications that are now known that actually influence which genes get used and not used, which are epigenetic um in in humans and they can be they're found targeted and then in theory if they if that modification by that epigenetic tag or epigenetic marker could lead to a disease or does lead to a disease treatments can be found to target that and switch it back off or do whatever it needs to be done is that the sort of the principle behind it so if a protein is where it's not supposed to be and therefore having a negative consequence you can change that with a small molecule drug um, okay. what's 
really interesting, and I hope this is not too much detail, is that... Let's um... try it. Let's try it, Will. <laughs> I'll, ask, I'll ask a stupid question if I have to. Don't worry. Um, what I find absolutely fascinating is, so, so we look at, um, at enzymes called histone acetal transferases. So they, they stick acetal groups on histones. Uh, okay. But then they also bind direct, uh, directly to DNA to turn on certain genes. And it's very specific where they bind. Now, modifying a protein over here and binding to a, a bit of DNA over here can actually have the same consequence, even though it's a completely different mechanism of action. So what is amazing is that you have this confluence in biology where, you know, inhibiting something can actually have the same effect but by two different mechanisms because of of, of how evolution conserves how certain uh, proteins have function wow okay i feel like we could just be doing a whole show on epigenetics but but which because i feel like that this yeah, is that's wrong. The, the, re, the, re, the, the reason why i like it is is that again it's one of those words that's been thrown around particularly in health technology for a very long time and I think it's just good to get under the skin of what these things need, these things mean. Um, so we're going to come back after a short break, two minutes. We'll be back with our guest, Will West, who's the CEO of Cell Centric, uh, which is an epigenetic cancer drug biotech. And we will um, pick up the conversation and move more into some of their development around their current compounds. So we'll be right back. UK Health Radio, the station that makes you feel good. The station that makes you feel good. Hello and welcome back to this week's Health Tech Hour with me, Steve Roost, and my guest, Will West, the CEO of Cell Centric. So, Will, just before the break, we had a bit of a hardcore masterclass in the world of epigenetics. So let's like when uh, what I found fascinating about this type of area, I would say in general, is that there is, it's such a broad area to begin with because it's sort of conceptual in the sense of we know this code layer exists and we're then going to try and find out where it actually ha it exists, the impact that it has, and then off the back of that, we can start to do something about it. So how did you start to sort of actually narrow down what you could do and how you did, did that, right? Because you could have... It's, it's so broad, particularly in the early days of one of these new fields. Yeah, no, it was, it was really interesting. So some people were beginning to look at the tags on DNA and, and saying, well, can we use them as a diagnostic tool? So if, if you have this certain tags over here, but not over here, is that then predictive of something? And, and certainly mm -hmm. a number of uh, companies have now developed using epigenetic tags, markers, for doing diagnostics. Um, we were more interested in looking at particular proteins and their roles in turning off certain uh, genes um, that were associated with cancer. And if you could stop those, um, could you potentially develop new therapeutics that other people you know, didn't have insight to? I suppose the biggest challenge that we had being sort of the, one of the first people in the space was we knew that knowledge was going to be king, but whilst we had you know, the world expert, perhaps in uh, in epigenetics as our scientific co-founder, we were never going to have the body of knowledge sort of across the whole globe. So actually, during the first period of the company, we formed a number of uh, research relationships with key leading labs all around the world, from Tokyo to um, California, to basically work with them, see what they were doing. Mm -hmm. If there was something to commercialise, we would then strike a license with that institute, but we would do all the hard graft basically for free. And so we created this network of um, academics that we could then aggregate their information and go, well, actually, this particular protein is interesting for four different reasons, and therefore we should be exploring this. So we took quite an academic approach, which is probably completely the wrong way to do it, and say, well, if we have the best knowledge, can we then take that up and then really pick those proteins that, that might be the most interesting as potential new drug targets. And what did you discover when you did that? 
So we found about 50 different proteins that could be of interest. Um, we then actively worked on seven of them. Uh, we developed a uh, what's called a lead drug. So that's not a final drug, but it's like a sort of a, a prototype drug uh, to one. Um, and then we um, sold that to Takeda Pharmaceuticals, so the, the large Japanese pharmaceutical company. Um, but we kept pushing forward with, with three of our own. And then one really began to stick out. And so this is two twin proteins. One's called P300, the other's called CBP. Uh, as I said, they're histone acetyl transferases. Um, but actually what they do is they trigger the expression of key proteins and genes associated with cancer. So if you inhibit P300 and CBP, you stop the expression of MYC, IRF4 and, uh, and, and certain hormone uh, receptor proteins, which are all known to be very important in cancer. So okay. it was kind of, sorry. So hold on, no, no, no. So, so what, what the, you discovered, you, you discovered, or you focused on a protein or two proteins, P300 and CBP, right? Is that right? And, yes. And, and, those, and those proteins were part, were epigenetic tags that in effect, if they were switched off, off, switched off, they would um, prevent the release of certain hormones that promoted cancer. So it was a way to stop those hormones being expressed or genes expressing. Is that right? Did I get that right? Almost. Not quite right. So no, give it to me again. <laughs> <laughs> so P300 and CBP create tags. So okay. they are not tags. They create tags. They're, so they're okay. enzymes. So they right. make stuff. Okay. Um, but if you inhibit them, you stop them doing that and you stop them expressing uh, certain genes that are associated with aggressive cancer. So right. And what it, cancers, what, what cancers are we sort of predominantly talking about? So initially we were looking at um, uh, the antigen receptor pathway and its relevance to late stage prostate cancer. But actually okay. where we've had most success clinically is in multiple myeloma so this is uh, one of the blood cancers there's a whole range of them but one of the blood cancers is really driven by two genes irf4 and mic which we completely knock down by inhibiting these two twin proteins so it was kind of we could see what was happening in the lab we had a really good chemistry we could get a really good small molecule to bind into p300 and cbp to stop them working and then that was leading to clinical benefit. And it was kind of that combination of understanding the biology, having really good chemistry, but then seeing the clinical benefit that came together to say, actually, there's a drug here. And it's for specifically for uh, a certain type of multiple myeloma. OK, and with this, is the, is, the, is the thinking behind the drug that this is a therapy that someone would take on an ongoing basis that would continue to block these, um, block the enzymes? To, 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 I mean, what sort of, is it sort of like a regular thing for the rest of someone's life or is there a point where they stop taking it or like how does it sort of work in effect? So you're exactly right. So we developed a, a, a small molecule drug that, that combined into P300 and CBP to stop them working. The advantage of that type of drug is you can take it orally. So you can just take it at home. Right. It's not an infusion like a lot of the modern um, therapies are. It's not a, a, a cell-based therapy which are Yes, they're hugely expensive, but actually they spend you have to spend a lot of time in hospital. And is that um, is that what you mean? Like the, the, the new kind of tech bio type um um what is it, the, the CAR T cell therapies and things like that. Yeah, so the CAR T's and, and, and similar things. So actually if you talk to patients, and this is something since we've started our clinical trials, we've spent a lot of time on, particularly at the Christie Hospital, and they've been great at supporting this activity. Um you talk to real patients and they're like a, I want to feel better on this therapy, but B, I want to go to the shops. I want to go yeah. fishing. <laughs> yeah. I want to meet up with my friends and play bridge. I don't mm. want to be spending a lot of time going to and from hospital. So um, our drug is already available. Yes, you take it at home. You inhibit the proteins. You can take it on an ongoing basis. We've had patients that are on our drug now for uh, over 15 months uh, where the drug has been well tolerated and we've seen their uh, cancer kept in check. So, yeah. Um, is, there, is, there a, is there a resistance that gets built up or is it not that it doesn't work that way? 
potentially, all drugs can potentially become resistant. Um, I suppose one of the interesting aspects of what we're doing is that in multiple myeloma, one of the key types of drugs that you get are called the imid class of drugs. So this is things okay. like lenalidomide, pomalidomide, things like that. And you become resistant to those after a period of time, exactly as you've just said. Mm. If you give our drug in combination with one of those imids, actually you repotentiate the uh, Oh, the, you you like reboot it almost. You reboot it exactly. So oh, that's you cool. See, yeah. So and, particularly and what, in multiple myeloma, and, and why is that? What, what's the scientific explanation behind that reboot? Like what? Yeah. I mean, what, to, I say scientific like, to a point. I mean, you know, dumb it down for me. Well, but you know, how does that work? Because that sounds super cool. It is really super cool. And we've worked with people like um, Leif Bergsegel at the Mayo Clinic on this to really try and understand uh, some of the mechanistic aspects of that. To be honest, I don't think we fully understand why that is the case. Uh, we've certainly got hints and we've got some uh, publications that will be coming out in the scientific domain relatively soon. OK. Um, but it is really interesting because if you've got a standard of care type of therapy for a particular disease, you can then still use that but with our drug as well and get not only more efficacy but longer efficacy so patient free progression you know people stay alive for longer that's what you really want so it's this idea of having a new drug that not only works itself mm. but can actually enhance existing therapies which people really like yeah i mean i look again i'm by, by no means a cancer expert at all and, and i'm certainly not a health economic expert but i would imagine that there's uh, a huge sort of personal patient satisfaction, general happiness from not being required to go into a hospital and have an IV drip to receive your treatment on an ongoing basis, um, quite apart from the kind of downstream costs of, of doing that. So, you know, I, I know that there's, I don't know if they're, I'm not sure they work exactly the same way, or whether they're genetic markers, but I know that there's other sort of treatments in the uh, brain cancer space and lung cancer space which might work the similar way, I'm not sure, but it's effectively a pill that you can take on a daily basis that can keep your keep your 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 cancer in check, um, as opposed to you know lots of rounds of chemo or, or in addition to, like you said, um, yeah, yeah. To, to to help that help that pathway. Um, so that I think that's all absolutely fascinating. So how 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 far can this epigenetic? I mean, how there are sixty pro, sixty? Did you say sixty tags or sixty markers in epigenetics that you know right now? Sixty proteins. How do you say it? What's the right thing to say? Uh, yes, modifications. Yes. Um, how many do you think that there might be? What's the vet, what's the prevailing view on how far this goes? It's like, <laughs> what's the I don't know. How big's the universe in this stuff? I don't think we really know, and we certainly don't know how they interact with each other. Um, so certainly, right. a lot of uh, initial effort uh, went on to sort of DNA methylation, so methyl tags being put onto DNA. And this goes back to one of your earlier points, actually. It's because, you know, one of the first tools that we had was measuring DNA methylation. And therefore, right. a lot of people were looking at that and thinking, oh, this is this is the thing in epigenetics. Uh, it's going to be epigenetics. Uh, well, it's actually there's loads of other stuff going on. So uh, we don't fully understand how all these different things interact. Uh, I don't think there are going to be hundreds of these things. Um, I think we probably have learned almost all there is to know now. OK. But it, but I wouldn't say it's that you know one becomes sixty. It's sixty, but multiple. There's interactions, right? It's like it's it's Precisely. okay. So so there's a total universe of sixty or seventy, but actually suddenly it's there's all the different variations and interactions of the of the whole thing. Exactly. That's exactly um, that is absolutely fascinating. I mean, slightly mind boggling. It is. It is. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's <laughs> like well, I mean, it, it's kind of just understanding how things work on such a granular level um so again this is might sound like a very basic question but you said earlier that some epigenetic modifications can be inherited or passed on is that correct or is that a theory or has it been proven or how where does that sort of stand so Certainly, um, people's metabolism, for instance, is... Oh, is that epigenetic? Is that an epigenetic modification, your metabolism? Some aspects of it? Some aspects of it. Not all, oh. but some aspects of it. Again, I, um, I'm not an expert on this. 
Um, but um, so Nessa Carey, who was the founding chief scientific officer of Cell Centric, who did write the definitive book <laughs> on genetics. <laughs> <laughs> She did go into this in a lot of detail about, you know, the, the heritable side of it. But it, it is absolutely fascinating um, that, yeah, things that happen in your lifetime can be passed down to your kids. Definitely. That is, that's 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 wild. It is. I mean, that's really wild. I think everyone we understood. Didn't, except... We didn't know that biology since Darwin. I mean, this is. No. This is... Do you think yeah. that, again, this is a this is a complete left field. So feel free to be like, I'm going to pass on that question. But is this partly where possibly some of these um, ingrained mig- migratory routings and things like that from animals come from, where they kind of just have this like knowledge of where the breeding grounds are and where the where they go and how they kind of migrate around the world. And it just gets passed down through generation to generation and almost necessarily like figured out how. I don't know. I don't know why. Neither. neither do I. I don't know. I just, I just, <laughs> it, it seems kind of interesting. Um, so uh, let's, what I want to do, we're going to go for a commercial break in a couple of minutes. But before we do, I think I'd like to try and, you know, pass on some knowledge to, to listeners. Because I think that that in my experience, my, so my wife has um, spent a lot of time in biotech, drug discovery and done various different things. So I've, I've been sort of exposed to, you know how long it takes to bring drugs and treatments to market and and the costs involved and the difficulties and things like that i think that there's probably some misconceptions out there i think probably amongst the general public about how easy it is to do these things based on you know the reaction to some of the stuff that happened during covid and things like that so i think what what do you think some of the biggest misconceptions are or that you've encountered from people in you know the wider world about how drugs are developed and how easy or not it is to get something out. Like, let's just start there. There's, there are many aspects of that question, as, as you probably appreciate. Um, I mean, I think the first rule is that the the vast vast majority of research and development R and D doesn't work. Yeah, you, you have a high idea, you test it, it doesn't work. You learn from that, you test something else, that doesn't work. You learn from that, you try again. It is an incredibly iterative process. You need incredible patience, thick skin, tenacity, because <laughs> uh, it mostly doesn't work. And and as we were saying, I mean, you know, a lot of biology we we don't truly understand. Um, the fact that inhibiting P300 CBP can have such a profound effect, it's kind of interesting that it is so specific in a way. Mm. Um, but then to, to go back to the vaccine stuff that we started talking about, I mean, you know, HIV, where's the vaccine? COVID. That's the vaccine. did an incredible job as, as a sort of global community really pushing that forward. So interesting. You know, we don't fully understand biology. I hate to use the word luck, but there is a little bit of serendipity in everything as well. Mm. Um, but no, it's mainly hard graft and grind to get a drug forward. And what's the rough timeline for a drug to, from, you know, the beginning of R&D to actually being available? Generally, what's the average timeline? I, I, I think commonly quoted is anywhere between sort of eight and 12 years, something like that. Right. Which I think is... I think that's roughly what I thought it was, which is kind of amazing if you think about, you know, you've got people starting a company to build a product that may not even be publicly available for 12 years, you yeah, know, exactly. which is an incredible commitment to the cause, you know, of continuing to build that. And, you know, I think that's something that I, one of the misconceptions that I've come across is just a, a general lack of understanding or appreciation about how long the cycles are with these things. And therefore, I mean, that you're talking about, full companies with lots of people doing lots of things for 12 years right? and that needs to be funded right the way through you know and and then and, and you might get to a point where at year 10 you it fails in one of the trials and that 10 years is just a bust right like it you know that's that's the that's that's an unfortunate side effect isn't it it's it's a very high risk game there's a huge amount of attrition most biotech companies fail I think, though, the other point to make is that most companies look at a, an asset or a potential product for only a certain period. So, you right. know, one biotech company <clears throat> might do early research, one might do the early clinical trials, another one might pick up and do the late stage clinical trials, and then the big pharmaceutical company comes in and then commercializes it. So, mm-hmm. very few biotechs actually go from concept 
through to clinical trials and commercialization. I mean, frankly, I think cell centric is very unusual, but we didn't even go from the concept of the drug. We went before that, you know, an area of science that nobody really knew how it was going to yeah. be applied. We've taken that through to now mid stage clinical trials. And, you know, not many companies do that for as and long what, as we have. And what, what was different about you guys? Or was it was it the people, the approach? The, 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 I don't know. Why, why were you guys slightly different than the norm in that in that respect? I think it's a combination of different things. I mean, one is that we did manage to form some commercial partnerships early that helps, you know, frankly, keep us, keep the lights, keep the lights on. on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Give us some momentum. Uh, we've also had fantastic uh, shareholder support, particularly from uh, Morningside based in Boston. So that's a, a private family fund. So they can, they can be very patient if they believe in the team and the science. So they won't react knee jerk wise um, we have had offers to, to buy the company in the past but we've also been excited about the potential of the drug and charging that forward ourselves so we've been balancing that up as well so yeah I mean it, it it's a combination of things so partly it, it was seeing the science through partly it's the team that's taken that through and partly it's it's the shareholders and, and their patients and their belief as well Cool. Well, look, we're going to go for our final commercial break now, and we will be back in two minutes with the final part of today's show with Will West from Cell Center. We'll be right back. UK Health Radio, the station that makes you feel good. UK Health Radio, the station that makes you feel good. Hello and welcome back to the final part of this week's show um, on the Health Tech Hour with my guest today, CEO of Cell Centric, Will West. So, Will, um, what is your view generally on the state of, I would say, well, sorry, let me rephrase it. The UK government continues to make a huge statement or statements about their desire to maintain or improve the UK's standing within life sciences particularly life sciences, med tech, health tech. Um, they believe that to be a huge strength of, of the UK. And I, 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 would, I think that that's historically been the case. Um, what's your view generally on that? Do you think we're in a good spot? Do you think there's work to be done? You know, what's your view as a, a founder in, in, in definitely in the life science space? I do think the government is committed to continuing to fuel UK life sciences. I do believe we punch above our weight globally that does take further investment and commitment. I do think there are things that we can potentially still do further. I think um, the Shaughnessy report that came out recently highlighted some of those. I mean, if we want to be nimble and flexible and learn some of the lessons from the recent pandemic, we should be having a more flexible and uh, adaptive regulatory framework with a fully um, resourced MHRA, which is our, our sort of government regulatory body. And I know that the government is committed to addressing some of that. I think we do have world-class expertise in um, running clinical trials in the UK. I do think that can be leveraged further. Um, the last point, which others will know more about than me, is on, on data and healthcare data and, you know, the, the amazing uh, potential of, of, of having the NHS and leveraging that in an appropriate way. Um, so, yeah, no, I, I, I do think, you know, you're well, bullish. <laughs> I am bullish. Yes. Good. What was it that they said recommended about the MHRA specifically? What was it? What were they said? I didn't see that. Um, so the MHRA uh, did reduce in size, and then it needs to be beefed back up again because okay. it needs to cope with the workload that's coming in. Which makes sense. I also think that they need to, um, and this is something I've talked about before on the show with various different people, but. I think there needs to be some real serious thought given to the overall regulatory framework piece of it to ensure that we don't fall behind the EU and the US in terms of ability to get treatments, devices, whatever it happens to be through and into the market, because we happen to currently exist almost as a third system. Right. We don't accept alignment with the EU at this point and we don't accept alignment with the FDA. In theory, you have to go and get your own UKCA mark. 
Um, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that, but I think at some point we have to have a process like, for example, um, Switzerland now will accept FDA, for example. If you want to launch in Switzerland, as do many other countries, like you know, in the Middle East, they will accept FDA as an equivalent. So I don't know if you feel like that's something that might have to happen. Well, I mean, you know, I run a, a small biotech company, yeah, in theory, based in Cambridge, UK. We operate globally. We've got clinical right. trials all over the place. But where are we most likely to launch first? Well, it's going to be in the US. Well, right. I, yeah. Well, why would we launch in the UK? Uh, secondly, is yeah, we'd we'd go to either Japan or <laughs> or the EU. So, uh, yes, it's one about market size, but second is it's about absolutely right it's regulatory alignment as well so you know this idea that we can separate ourselves from other regulatory regions doesn't make sense we have to have alignment and uh yeah and, and yes and obviously the fda are the kind of the lead player in our sector i think that's one of the fallacies of brexit without wishing to get into the politics of it this is just one of the unfortunate pieces of fallout where maybe people didn't completely appreciate the possible downstream impacts of what would happen, which is you really risk, like you say, being more towards the back of the queue, you know, like in Australia, for example, that, and, 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 than, a, than, a, than a US or an EU, right? Because those are the EU, US, Japan, top of everybody's list, particularly for, for drugs and like that. And then, you know, you'll kind of get swept up afterwards, you know, and then maybe there'll be some homegrown people, maybe there won't be, um, but you're limiting your access to the best things, basically. But I think there are some opportunities as well. So if we can get a really good clinical trial system up and running in the UK with flexible regulatory frameworks that are aligned with other global territories, that does give us a, a bit of an edge based on our operational competence here. Actually, there's something we can do with it. So, okay. again, I, I, I don't think we need to be half glass empty. We, we no, can right? with, yeah. with with the intent no i mean in our life science and med tech and it, it is real it is fantastic like there's no question about it i think where i sort of start to get a little bit confused is a bit like well yes i do believe that there has to be government support and there has to be frameworks and there has to be a kind of environment but at what point does the government stop stepping in because i also believe in the power of private businesses Absolutely. and entrepreneurs and you know those type of things but but in an instance where you could argue that although, although investment in life sciences and health tech is, is relatively buoyant, um, VC investment has reduced pretty dramatically in the UK. So you can't have everything in that sense. So if, if entrepreneurs are building businesses, particularly in health tech and life science, they need funding because the route to profitability is just longer in those businesses than it might be in other businesses. And so if the, if, if, if the traditional pathways for that capital have been reduced because of the economic situation, then where else is it going to come from? So is there a role for government in direct funding? That, that's a very long debate and yeah. uh, pros and cons. But I think yeah. on the regulatory side, there is a clear role for government, right? Yes, now. yes. yes. <laughs> that's and literally so, the government. It literally so, is the government. Let, let, let's, let, let's focus on that. Um, I mean, I've, I've raised money in Japan. I've raised it in North America. I've raised it in, in the UK as well. You know, this is a global market. So I don't think we need to be territorial about the financial front. But um, obviously more can be done. And I know uh, there are explorations of, you know, how can you get pension funds to work more uh, actively like they do in Scandinavia to, to invest that slightly more risk, but into things like uh, life sciences. I mean, there are other different mechanisms that, that can be explored. But uh, but for me, the government thing is, it's yes, yeah, getting the regulatory frameworks working correctly. I, I, I completely agree with you. I completely agree with you. You can't have a situation where, you know, it's two years just to get through the regulatory audit and things like that. You just can't. That's crazy, you know, which is where we, we, we might be heading. So, um, OK, cool. So what's next for Cell Centric? What happens next? Uh, so today was quite an exciting day. Um, so um, if you have initial clinical uh, data to show that your drug works and meets an unmet need, so in other words, people who can't be treated by anything else and you can show effects, um, and that's substantial and innovative, you can apply to the FDA for something called Fast Track, which is a way of them mm. uh, accelerating uh, how they review your uh, clinical data 
as it progresses towards a, a full market authorization. So uh, we announced that we had gained that uh, today. Oh, congratulations. That's very yeah. exciting. Which is, you know, really, really good. I mean, a fantastic work by the team, putting all that data together. I mean, the early clinical results are looking really strong. Uh, we announced some at uh, uh, the European Hematology Association meeting last week uh, in Frankfurt. Uh, the main presentation of our data will be in December at uh, ASH, which is the American Society of Hematology. There's about 30, 40,000 people who go all in one place. Can you believe it? Wow, that's a lot. So that's, that's when we're really going to announce our main multiple myeloma data. But so far, it's looking really quite exciting. And yeah, I mean, that that for us now is the next six month period is building that body of data and then announcing it at ASH. And, and is, is it a bit of an arms race at the moment within this epigenetics field? Is sort of everyone really just trying to or is it there's actually due to the complexities and the scientific complexities of it there's just a limited number of people that even have the capabilities to work in it or is it sort of now the new hot thing and everyone's trying to pile in no it is a bit of an arms race i mean you know developing drugs is very very competitive and there are lots of different ways of having the same end result as we were talking a bit about before um so there are other epigenetic related drugs that have come through targeting things like pmt5 ezh2 lsd1 so these are other proteins um, we are the first people to, well, we were the first people to go into the clinic with a P300 CBP inhibitor. Uh, there is now another uh, US-based company doing that. There are probably three or four other companies that are actively looking at this program, but we're probably 18 months to two years ahead. So our drug is called first in class. Is, is the, the main Oh, drug. nice. We are, yeah, the first one. <laughs> the first of one. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but this, this relates to something else that you said earlier, which is, you know, how do you pronounce the name of your drug? Well, yeah. it's Inobrodip, Inobrodip. Uh, but we had to come up with that name because that right. the last bit of that name will now be used for all other drugs in this class. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. You named it, you're the category. You named it. That is yeah, quite cool. We got to name the category. And bizarre, that pretty cool. that's controlled by the World Health Organization, which I also didn't know. Wow. <laughs> God yeah. blimey. That's 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 archaic, isn't it? That they control drug naming. That's a that's a hangover from somewhere, isn't it? That's, that's just that's a legacy. That's a legacy thing. There's someone over there with just like a you know handwritten ledger, just writing them in, just one by one. I love that. That's great. Um, so with it, well, I know that within um, so the just the, the the drug itself, the 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 IP that you've developed is around how the drug inhibits those markers is that correct that's where the magic is if that makes sense because the markers the, the the p300 is visible to anyone that looks for p300 sort of it's sort of a, it's there in effect no, the, pat the patterns are around the drug itself yeah uh, the shape of that drug and how it then binds into p300 and cbp you can't right. patent p300 and cbp because they are known proteins Everyone has them, give or take. Yeah, so it, but it was their functionality that was unknown, and the mm. impact of, in, uh, of inhibiting them was also unknown. So that's the IP is around the inhibitor, not the protein targets. Okay. Um, well, in the last couple of minutes of the show, particularly when we get entrepreneurs on, which is quite often, I like to just kind of understand a bit about what drives you personally. And, and you know, as, as you sort of alluded to, developing drugs is quite hard. So, you know, there's a lot of, you know, negativity and losses before you get to a win. So what, what has kind of kept you um, on your mission during those tough times? Like, how have you sort of kept yourself motivated and kept yourself moving forward when when things maybe weren't going your way? I, I think it goes back to a time when uh, it was about 10 o'clock at night. And I was in what's called a hot room. It's literally like a, a small room that's at 37 degrees. So it's just hot. Right. And I was waiting for this particular uh, blot to emerge and whether or not a spot was going to happen on a piece of gel in the right place. And it came up and it's like, oh, my goodness, that antibody is really binding to that place there. I'm the only one in the world who knows this. Really? So I, yeah. That's what no, it was that, like. That's a oh, wow. Yeah. So, you know, there are eureka moments where you're doing stuff that nobody else is doing. And there is definitely a buzz to that. <laughs> and is that the same for everybody in the company? or is, And is that something that you've sort of used as a way to keep people motivated on that journey? 
I do think we've ended up with relatively like-minded people, although we've got very different skills. Um, you've got to be in it for the right reason. We are trying to make a difference to, to the lives of people with cancer. That is what drives us. I think, as I said, you know, meeting up with cancer patients, really understanding their stories, where they're coming from, and knowing that actually you could be proud of what you're doing when you talk to your family and friends. I mean, you know, that's the thing. That is, a, I completely agree with you. And, I, and actually, I think that it's becoming more of the thing as, 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 as society moves on, you know, more of the purpose driven, wanting to have an impact. Um, that's certainly something that Pop Doc that we, that we benefit from as well, as people want to come do something that makes a difference in the real world to people's health. So, no, I completely understand. Um, well, look, we've, we've reached the end of the show. So, Will, thank you so much for coming on. I apologize for my basic questions. But again, like I said, we're broad church people. This area clearly is of huge possible impact to the human race. So I think it was kind of a public service for us to try and unpick it a little bit. Um, I wish you all the best at Self Centric. That's super exciting. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much for coming on the show. Cheers, Stephen. Good luck with your enterprise, too. Thanks so much. Thank you. And thank you to everyone for listening. We'll be back again next week. Thank you.